I am here with uh, Rick Meyer from the Montgomery County Coalition for the Control of Cell Towers. And he is a 35 year Montgomery County resident. He has been working on the issue of cell towers in the county for many years, since 2016. And this issue goes back even previous to that, as I know Rick's going to talk about. He's also worked in the insurance industry and in the tech industry for many years. And I'm so thankful for all the work that you've done on looking at the process that cell towers and the procedures by which cell towers are permitted in the country, which is ever more important with this new ZTA, uh, which would allow cell towers closer to homes than they've ever been in residential zones. So take it away, Rick. All right, well, Theodore, thank you very much. And to all of you that are joining the conversation tonight, the call, I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, huge accolades to uh, the Environmental Health Trust and all the hard work that you're doing personally and as an organization for um, helping communities deal with wireless regulation. And it is a immensely complicated and uh, sometimes extremely frustrating uh, process to get involved with. But I think ultimately, um, as you, as you uh, see in Montgomery County here, and as we're going to see on this tonight, um, it's worth the journey. We've learned an awful lot, and I think we're actually making some progress. So, uh, Theodora, if you if you want to bring up the slides, we'll go ahead and watch that. There we go. Uh, if I can, I'm, I'm just going to uh, start off with a very famous image. This is Judith Monroy, uh, Monroy in her front yard on Link Lane in Santa Rosa. California. And in just a minute, an even more famous image that came from her front yard is going to show up. But I think the frustration on her face in trying to figure out what to do with the, the wireless tower that has showed up just a few front feet from her front door is a frustration that we share here uh, in Montgomery County. And, and more specifically with the piece of legislation 1907 that uh, has been reintroduced and which we're going to be talking about extensively tonight, uh, that has an awful lot of amazingly uh, great features in it for the wireless industry. Uh, we're going to be talking about why the wireless industry loves it and what it is that you can do to stop that bill. So let's uh, dive in on our next slide here. First of all, a little bit of a commercial about what MC4T is all about, the Montgomery County Coalition for the Control of Cell Towers. Um, what we are fighting for, and because uh, again, we're not, we're not in the business just to to fight against zoning text amendments that have been put out there multiple times in the last few years. But we're actually fighting for a, a few very important things. And, and, and most specifically, uh, and most absolutely, is transparency and resident participation in the wireless siting decisions in our communities. And as many of you here in Montgomery County know, but also perhaps if you've dialed in from other communities, that tends to be a real uh, issue uh, consistently across jurisdictions is how difficult it is for uh, for people to participate in this process. Um, in Montgomery County, we have been working and we continue to work on uh, uh, with our county executive and his staff, urging them along to make fixes to the chronic dysfunction of wireless administration by the Tower Committee, which is the group of employed uh, Montgomery County uh, public servants along with uh, representatives of some some other local agencies um, but also uh, administration by DPS that affects wireless deployments. The FIX process which we started uh, more than a year ago uh, in conversations with the county executive's office which we greatly appreciated unfortunately was interrupted by the COVID pandemic and understandably so. Um, the very small executive staff that works for the uh, county executive has been uh, dealing with the unbelievable uh, sets of issues surrounding COVID and still trying to deal with those issues. Uh, we are opposed to, uh, this is what we are actually fighting against, zoning ordinances being passed by the county council of any type until all pending litigation has been uh, resolved in Montgomery County. And uh, I'm going to come back to that slide in a minute on what ZTA 1907 is. But if I could just finish with what we're fighting for here, there are two, um, two pieces of, of litigation that's out there. One of them, the second one that's listed here under this bullet, is uh, the one that EHT, uh, Environmental Health Trust, has been 
uh, so material in uh, bringing in the district court here, uh, local district court against the FCC, which has to do with uh, updating uh, wireless um, radio frequency standards. Uh, there's another case, however, most people do not know about this. Don't get it confused with some prior litigation that was out there. And that is the League of California Cities versus FCC. That's the case number uh, for that in the Ninth Circuit where this particular case and several others have been consolidated. This is a new case that has to do with concerns over 6409, section 6409, which deals with concealments and expansions. Montgomery County, Maryland is a co-petitioner. Let me repeat that again. This is a new case where Montgomery County, Maryland is a co-petitioner. I could spend a great deal of time talking about these two pieces of litigation. Maybe we can do, uh, Theodora, schedule something down the road here. We'll come back and talk about it in more detail. But uh, again, I wanna give huge accolades to Theodora and her organization for uh, all the work that they're doing on their litigation. Um, um, with regard to RF emissions. We want to end the massive subsidization of wireless applications in Montgomery County. This is something that's been going on for more than a dozen years where uh, taxpayers are funding these applications. We'd like to end that. And uh, this is much more of a recent issue that we are uh, really trying to changing gears on and ratcheting up. Uh, we are fighting for mandatory on-site RF measurements for all wireless facilities on rooftops of multi-story buildings particularly those where uh, you've got residents underneath and all MCPS school sites. So that's what we're fighting for. Let's take a look at the uh, uh, agenda for tonight, if we can, uh, or the next slide rather. Just hit return. Is it not clicking? Is it? I clicked it. Is it not Is there? Not, I see it. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit of a spoiler just to put it up front on the conversation, I forgot I put it in this sequence. I wanna make sure that uh, we all get a chance to uh, understand what the highlights are of ZTA 1907. Uh, this is a bill uh, that was originally brought forward uh, uh, more than a year ago that seeks to allow small cell towers, which aren't so small, in residential neighborhoods just 30 feet away from houses. Um, these would uh, include uh, placements on utility poles, street lights, lamp posts, all of which can be replaced with new fatter poles topped by antennas. And again, just 30 feet from your, uh, from your residence. There would be uh, no direct notice under the provisions that are, are, are being proposed to any resident, even if the cell tower would be smack in front of your home. Uh, if you weren't paying attention or if somebody didn't notify you, um, it would be, uh, uh, the first inkling you got of it was the auger truck shows up to start digging the hole. Um, there's no public hearing, so you don't have an opportunity to fight back. And with a special permit that, uh, that allows these as limited use, uh, the towers could even be, uh, I'm sorry, as a conditional use, these cell towers could be even closer because there are no minimum setbacks at all. If necessary, uh, a hearing examiner in a uh, special proceeding could decide to let uh, that pole go right up against your house. Uh, it also allows equipment cabinets and some other unfortunately bad features. We're gonna talk about those in more detail in a few minutes. What are we gonna cover this evening on the next slide? Uh, we're gonna talk about ZTA 1907 and what you can do to stop this bad bill because we need your help. We're gonna talk about uh, 5G deployment in Montgomery County because it is the 5G wave or the movement toward 5G that I think is, is compelling an awful lot of uh, uh, efforts to justify the need for speeding up uh, the deployments inside of neighborhoods. I wanna talk, look about some of the myths behind that. And uh, I'm gonna uh, delve into, as I mentioned in more specifics about 1907, I just gave you a quick summary slide on why there are some huge handouts for big wireless in the uh, proposed zoning text amendment. And uh, why unfortunately this zoning text amendment uh, essentially legalizes what has been done for years anyway in Montgomery County. I'm gonna show you some terrible examples of administrative failures uh, that would be essentially legal with the new uh, litigate, uh, le legislation that's been proposed. So let's go to the next slide. Here's that famous image. This is uh, from the, uh, the front yard, Judith's front yard in Santa Rosa, California. 
Um, we're in the same situation she's is. We're trying to stop the proliferation of ugly, unsightly, uh, bulky, uh, sometimes hazardous uh, wireless facilities in front yards. What you can do about it, you can start immediately. Call your council members tomorrow. Tell them that you still oppose ZTA 1907, remembering that this bill was introduced more than 18 months ago. We also would like to demand a new hearing. This bill has been substantially amended. I'm going to talk about those amendments in just a moment. And it has been more than 15 months since we had a hearing on the original legislation, which has been fundamentally altered since then. Uh, we have an action network tool that I am uh, going to be talking about a little bit more that uh, you could generate emails to your council members with just a few keystrokes. We urge you to please talk to your friends, your family members, your neighbors about why you were opposed to ZTA 1907 and encourage their opposition. We have got a Facebook page and a Twitter page. Uh, we'd love you to like us on Facebook and Twitter because the more people that do that, obviously, we are going to be driving more eyeballs to other eyeballs. And that's, that's a, a critical, critical thing. We are uh, trying to put together a event, a socially distanced, carefully um, uh, developed event, live event. Um, sometime I have, I have a ZTA No March that we are probably gonna try to pull together either in very late May or early June, depending on the timing of when we expect to see a vote uh, on this ZTA before the full council. If you live in a municipality, uh, please talk to your mayor, your town council, or your HOA. This municipality that is uh, dependent on um, uh, zoning from uh, Montgomery County. Uh, I know Tacoma Park is one of those jurisdictions. I think there's some small jurisdictions right around uh, the Northwest DC border, uh, around Chevy Chase and so forth. Um, and be sure to add your name to our mailing list. Uh, I had my email address up there before, control cell towers at mc 4 t I'm sorry, at gmail.com. Uh, please send us an email if you're not sure if on our, ma on our mailing list. Uh, if you've got friends, have them added to our mailing list so that we can stay in touch with you on, on developments. Let's go to the next slide. There's an awful lot of myths and an awful lot of hype that's been pumped, uh, particularly by one member of our county council, uh, that we are somehow falling behind in the race on 5G. And what I want to make sure that all of you are aware is that Montgomery County, according to all three major carriers, is positively glowing in 5G. What you are looking at is zoomed in pictures of Montgomery County. I've tried to get the scale and about the approximate same center point on all three of these images of the, the coverage maps for Verizon, for AT&T, and for T-Mobile. And as you can see, with the exception of some areas on the north uh, center of the uh, northern part of the county and, and areas right around um, the Potomac River, uh, where we've got the canyons of the Potomac River and some very rural areas where there hasn't been an awful lot of, of coverage anyway, uh, 5G is widely available and it is being extensively marketed in Montgomery County. And so the question that everybody would have to ask is, well, wait a minute. How's that possible? If we're being told that we have to, to suddenly put in uh, cell, cellular facilities in our neighborhood to facilitate 5G, how is it that all of the major carriers are insisting that 5G is here right now? And that's kind of a two-part answer, and I'm going to take you through that. Let's go to the next slide. First of all, keep in mind that in this initial phase, first phase of 5G rollout, in other words, the technology around 5G in Montgomery County by the three major carriers, uh, there have been literally hundreds of existing antennas that were built for 3G or early, early versions of 4G uh, that are now being swapped out to make uh, ready for the uh, upgraded 4G slash LTE and 5G at macro sites. And a macro site is generally something that is on a larger structure and much higher off the ground. Let's go to the next slide. Um, before I show you how many of those antennas have been deployed already, let me emphasize to you that the, there is not a one size fits all mix of 5G. And in fact, each of the three different carriers have got 
a slightly different spin on it. AT&T has got a thing called 5G evolution. The word evolution is very critical. Why? Because they're not at 5G yet. What they are offering is some super upgraded uh, 4G slash LTE um, uh, capabilities. And they are working on improving their 4G to get to 5G. They're still calling it 5G evolution and they're marketing on such. T-Mobile has got a thing called Nationwide 5G, and they are working very frantically, particularly in Mount Gary, Montgomery County, to deliver additional network capacity in the mid-band spectrum on their macro tower grid, right? And that's a very important strategic element for them. It is Verizon that is got a strategy built around small cells, particularly those that would likely be more frequently than not installed on, um, on utility poles, on light poles, on lamp posts. And it is uh, because of the way they are hoping to deploy millimeter wave band technology, which could be used, supposedly packaged in smaller packages. But wh why I'm stressing this to you is that as far as we can determine, the primary motivator behind the, 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 the push, the extensive push into the neighborhoods, we're trying to get zoning amendments so that these poles can go into neighborhoods is Verizon and uh, also another organization called Crown Castle. They don't actually sell cellular telephone services. They sell um, the ability for cellular carriers to, to get into their facilities and hang up their antennas. Crown Castle is the largest deployment of uh, on utility poles in Montgomery County currently. Next slide. Okay, so uh, I told you a minute ago that in this first phase of Montgomery County that we have seen literally hundreds of antennas. I'm gonna get specific on that in just a minute. This is a chart which is taken right from the Tower Committee database, uh, a pretty recent version of it, April 23rd, where we went back and counted up the number of applications that have been submitted to the Tower Committee, where the Tower Committee has actually acted on those applications. And uh, that's basically a one-to-one -one, uh, connection. And as you can see there, at, on buildings, on rooftops, there's been 210 um, applications between 2019 and 2020 on monopoles. Again, these are, these are typically much higher than 80 feet, some of them substantially higher than that, 111 applications. Uh, towers, these would be the big, big lattice towers. They're scattered around. There's been 46 applications. On utility poles, 39. And on water tanks, we don't have as many water tanks as you might imagine, but we got uh, enough of them. Uh, we've had 24 applications on that. What I want to draw your attention to, if I can, for just a minute, is the line that says utility poles. Utility poles, of which we have uh, more, than, more than 150 of them in the county right now that have got wireless facilities on them. There were 37 of those applications in 2019, but there were just two, just two in all of 2020. And I cannot for a moment think that that was because of the pandemic. I think the reason that we only had two applications, and by the way, there've been none for year to date 2021, is because the wireless carriers are waiting for ZTA 1907. They know it's going to be a lot easier, a lot faster, and a lot cheaper if that zoning text amendment comes through. A grand total of one application has not been recommended by the Tower Committee in the last two years and three months, four months actually. One application. So that's an almost 99% approval rate. And uh, uh, clearly, the Tower Committee has been working fairly hard through the pandemic, if you look at it relatively speaking, and they are certainly not holding up applications that are out there. Point before I go to the next slide, the actual transition before uh, 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 the conversion to 5G in Montgomery County started in 2019, about July 2019. So the applications that really started to see the, the swap outs of newer antenna equipment and gear started about the midway point of 2019. So that's gonna affect the calculation uh, that I made uh, based on that 450 total. We modified it a little bit to come up with the next slide. Back of the envelope end, uh, estimate. This is really critical. And this is information, by the way, that I wanna make sure that the county council understands. Again, the first phase of, of rollout of 5G in Montgomery County has been at macro sites. 
We're estimating that there have been 270 macrocyte applications since July 2019 that were processed by the Tower Committee, again, with a 99% approval rate. On those applications, what we have been seeing anecdotally is an average of three exclusively 5G antennas being requested for swap out, where they were taking a 4G and they were going to put in a 5G. If you do the simple math, of an average of three antennas times 270 macrocyte applications, that's 810 5G antennas, and probably more, because I'm using an average, and I think it's a, a conservative average, that have been put up on macrocytes so far in Montgomery County. Most of those are operating on multiple channels, meaning that that one antenna can be handling several different frequencies at the same time. And those swap outs are continuing. We've already got more of them on the May meeting agenda, which has been, which was moved until next week. Next slide. Um, how far do those signals go? This is very, very material because again, another piece of the hype, a lot of uh, the mythology that is out there that is being spread by one member of the council in particular is that uh, those signals don't go far. And that as a result of those signals, we have to be able to put these self uh, cellular facilities right up against your house. T-Mobile's nationwide 5G, let's focus that for a bit. AT&T has not published their information. And again, they're running 4G, so they're not 5G yet. Their macro cells, they believe, have effective capacity of several miles at least. That is to both send and receive. That's an incredible statistic, all right? By the way, the source is down there on the bottom right. Uh, corner. So any of you want to read about the materials or where I'm getting this information from. Verizon 5G's nationwide spectrum, by contrast, is about a few thousand feet, but that's a lot more than 30 feet. Their millimeter wave will go a few thousand feet. Let's go to the next slide. Where do we get that from? We get it from a guy by the name of Lowell McAdam. Until recently, he was the CEO and chairman of Verizon. He was interviewed in May 2018, and he responded to a very direct question from the interviewer on the right, right side of that, of that picture. There's a link on the bottom there to the interview. It's a fascinating interview. Interviewer, can you actually get somewhere where you don't need cell sites, you know, 25 feet from my house? That's a pretty relevant question about Gurmey County and ZTA 1907. What did he answer? We have now busted the myth that 5G frequencies have to be line of sight. They don't. We busted the myth that foliage will shut down. That does not happen. At 200 feet from the home, he scoffed. We are now designing the network for over 2,000 feet from the transmitter to the receiver. The receiver is your cell phone in your house, which has a huge impact on our capital needs going forward. In other words, what Mr. McAdam was saying is we can save money by being able to move a signal in greater distances. The myths, he concluded, have disappeared. Next slide. It gets better. Verizon put out a marketing video. It's really a pretty effective propaganda video, but it's a marketing video. And, a, and the highlight of that video, the link shown at the bottom down here, was an interview of a fellow by the name of Jason, who was identified as a Verizon field engineer. In the back of that car, he had a bunch of measurement equipment, and he was driving around Sacramento, California, which in 2018 was a test bed for Verizon. And in the course of that interview, your, your, the, screen, the, uh, the camera is switching back and forth to a laptop computer that is measuring speeds that are being picked up by this special car. It's down there on the bottom right. It's got a little antenna on the top of it. This is what he said, everybody doesn't think it goes very far, but it's a really big pipe and it's super fast speeds. And then in the interview, he says, we've driven about a third of a mile, that's 1,760 feet from the radio node. And we're still getting really good speeds, even though there's foliage in between. Down on the bottom is a screen grab. He went on to say, but we're even 3,000 feet away and we're getting gigabyte speeds. So if anybody tries to tell you and there are people on the council who might, that you cannot get reception unless you have this pole 300 feet from your, from your house. It's probably a good idea if they talk to Jason and if they talk to Lowell McAdam, because I think they're gonna find they're very, very wrong. Next slide. Montgomery County is what I'm trying to say as a conclusion to this first batch of slides, 
is in fact a regional leader in 5G deployment. The statistics that I gave you on the pages above, which showed the number of applications on macro sites and the back of the envelope calculations, I would hold those numbers up to any other jurisdiction in the Washington DC area. And I'll guarantee you that we are exceeding or, or, or at least equal to anybody. And that would include Arlington and Fairfax. In fact, I'll go a, a step further. If the only criteria that, that Amazon had used in selecting their headquarters had been 5G deployment, I think we probably would have been in first place. Next slide. What's in the ZTA for big wireless? Well, I kind of looked at the ZTA as a land rush. And by the way, uh, the evidence is the fact that we haven't seen any applications. They're waiting for the, the uh, starter pistol to go off so that they can all hustle over to the public rights of way, the PRW in Montgomery County and start hanging up their antennas. It's essentially bringing the Cimarron, Cimarron line rush to Montgomery County. Next picture, next slide, I'm sorry. Zoning Text Amendment 1907 was introduced by uh, Council Member Hans Reamer in October 2019. This was, uh, 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 I've stated this many times, this was the third time that he tried to bring uh, sponsored legislation to uh, allowing cell poles into um, residential neighborhoods. The public hearing for a bill that was introduced in October 2019, if this sounds like a long time ago, it was, was on November 19th, 2019. Those of you that are on the call tonight that were there, you may recall that there were 25 people that spoke uh, in opposition to the bill. There would have been many more that spoke in opposition, but the chairman of the committee, his name happened to be Hans Reamer, cut off the number of people who would be allowed to speak. There were a grand total of seven people who spoke in favor of the legislation. Five of those seven were lobbyists, lawyers, and other employees of the wireless industry. The bill was replaced in suspended animation by Mr. Reamer on February 1st, 2020. Some people may think that was because of COVID-19. It was not. We had been aggressively lobbying, and thanks to the efforts of people in Montgomery County, aggressively lobbying, particularly council members Friedson and Jawando, who were the other two members of the Fed committee. And they basically said they would not move the legislation out of their committee while there were two lawsuits pending against the FCC. These were not the two lawsuits that I just mentioned to you a few moments ago. These were different lawsuits that have since in fact been settled. That's why, unfortunately, Mr. Reamer reintroduced his bill in February, 2021. And at a committee of the, the Fed committee meeting, which is uh, public housing and economic development, I think that's right. Um, in March, 2021, that bill was dramatically amended. What we're going to talk about tonight is what that amended bill looks like. So can we go to that next slide? A little bit more detail here. First and foremost, what this bill does is it now allows a uh, wireless facility in a residential neighborhood strictly and totally as limited use. That means by right. That means that they can put on a, a utility pole, street light pole, or an approved parking lot pole, uh, but particularly the poles of the public rights of way can be replaced by right as limited use. Replace means essentially that you rip out whatever's there and you put in something fatter and taller that would be able to handle the additional weight and structural load of a wireless facility, including all the cabinets and wiring and so forth. Um, this means they be absolutely clear about it by all residential zones. I mean your neighborhood streets. Any kind of a neighborhood in Montgomery County that has got residential housing is now eligible under this bill for a facility to be uh, replaced on an existing structure. Uh, there's no notice, there's no signage, there's no public hearing. That's what by right means. They simply file an application, they get an approval from the tower committee, and they get, uh, they get a recommendation to go forward. You can, if you, are, if you are closely following the tower committee, and most people do not, if you closely follow the tower committee and you pay attention to their agendas, you dig through their agendas, you might know that they're getting ready to put those in your neighborhood. And if you do, you're welcome to send your input to the tower committee for their circular file. My experience over the last five years of tracking activity of the tower committee is they don't pay any attention to it. 
And if they do, it's typically because they don't have any other way around it. Next slide. Reduce setbacks. This is the critical element of this bill. This is the biggest handout to the wireless industry. They're basically letting them, even though they don't need them, they're gonna let them put them up to 30 feet by right from your front door. Any building intended for human occupation, 30 feet, that's by right. No hearing, no advance notice, no rights to come up and, and, and make your sentiments known where anybody would pay attention. Pick a pole and they can put it there. And again, let me make sure you understand this is replacements. Under the current zoning ordinance, a replacement of an existing pole is not allowed as limited use in residential zones. You can only use what's there. And most poles, many poles, will not stand for or, or be allowed to uh, accept the structural load, the additional weight of a uh, wireless facility. Um, I also want to make sure you understand that, that our current zoning ordinance would allow these poles to go in neighborhoods if there was a conditional use hearing. That's what the ordinance says. Although, as I've made a point, that particular uh, element of our current ordinance has never in fact been enforced. And I'm gonna show you some unfortunate, very unfortunate examples of that uh, a few slides away. But first let's get through 1907, next slide. Height of towers, uh, height of the cell poles that, uh, that would be allowed uh, has to do with how wide your street is. Almost all neighborhood streets uh, in Montgomery County are well under 65 feet in width, which means that the ordinance would now allow any pole to be replaced and a new pole put on it that could be six feet taller. That would be uh, the additional height with antennas and equipment up to six feet taller. So if you had in my neighborhood at North Potomac, a 15 foot pole, I could now make it about 23 foot pole, uh, 23 foot tall pole uh, with antennas. There's no restrictions on how big or thick or fat I can make that pole, but I can make it up to six feet taller. Um, on streets, and there are some of these in rare situations that are 60 feet, five feet or wider, regardless of how close that pole might be to your house, I can make it 15 feet taller. So if you happen to have a 30 foot street light and you are on a, on a double width uh, uh, of a boulevard or entrance road into some of the larger developments, nicer developments, you're un unlucky ones that now could have a pole that could be converted from being 30 feet to 40 feet, five feet tall. And again, that would be the pole plus the antennas has to be no higher than uh, 15 feet additional to what's there already. Um, utility poles, and uh, those are street lights. Utility poles and parking lot lights. I'm sorry, let me make clear on it. For street lights, that's anything that's got those cobra head lamps on it or whatever. Uh, that's the additional dimensions on it. For utility poles and parking lot lights, we can make them universally 10 feet higher. That also, by the way, has something to do with NEC safety codes, which typically try to lay uh, separation distance between the power lines and any kind of a, a wireless attachment. But those could be uh, automatically 10 feet taller. So if you've got a, and this is not an unusual circumstance, a 45 foot pole uh, on a street that leads into or possibly inside your neighborhood already, that now could automatically become 55 feet tall with, with antennas and additional pole height. There is no maximum height under the changes that were made at the Fed committee meeting for an eligible existing poll. The, the reason I'm pointing that out is because the FCC recently passed um, new rules and orders that defined a thing as a small cell as being no taller than 50 feet. Well, Montgomery County doesn't care about that element of the FCC leg legislation. In the, in the uh, changes that were made in the Fed committee, they basically saying, we don't care if a poll's there, how high or high it is, you can make it higher and put a, a cellular facility on it and still call it a small, officially treat it as if it was a small cell. Um, that picture, by the way, that you're looking at, uh, that's kind of one of my favorite examples. We're going to study in a little more detail in a minute. That is a house that you're looking at in the center of the picture that's in Prince George's County. The pole that's in front of that house is in Montgomery County. That, that residence is, is under 40 feet from that pole. But uh, if you want to talk about being bad neighbors, Montgomery County actually approved sticking that pole on a pie-shaped sliver of land uh, right up against that house in Prince George's County. That, that driveway 
uh, the next driveway up leads to a house in Prince George's County. Let's go to the next slide. Setbacks, conditional use. Now there, there's two ways that you can get uh, a pole put up uh, on a, uh, I'm sorry, a wireless facility on a utility pole. You can get it as limited use where it's by right, where it's auto, essentially automatic. We'll take it back one slide. Or you can um, uh, get it by conditional use. Although conditional use is being changed as well. So we're gonna tell you about those changes in just a minute. But under that, modification that was approved by the fed committee and uh, i wish you could have seen some of the, uh, the staff members face that was in that meeting when these changes were being approved because nobody could believe this was happening they actually reduced the minimum setback to zero there is no distance that's too short to put a pole up against the residents under the modifications that the Fed committee passed. We don't know why Mr. Juwando or Mr. Friedson agreed to that. I don't even I don't even know if they understood the significance of what they were agreeing to. But the setback under a conditional use, if you can get an uh, OZA hearing uh, proceeding for it, is now zero feet under a new procedure we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, under our current ordinance, and there's a two parts to this, under our current ordinance for a new structure or a replacement structure, theoretically at least, this has not been the case in fact, you're 300 feet from an existing dwelling. That's that's what the ordinance says, but it hasn't been enforced. On an existing structure, that would be an antenna on an existing structure. In other words, if you could find a cell pole that would handle the weight of your gear and equipment, you have to be 60 feet from a dwelling. And I've listed the specific citation of the ordinance so you know what I'm talking about, the 3.5.14 accessory commercial use part E. But let me repeat again, there's never been a conditional use hearing for a wireless antenna pole on a utility pole in Montgomery County. And we'll go to the next slide and talk about how we're changing conditional use. This is one of my favorite slides tonight. Conditional use is going to be essentially thrown into the trash dumpster just for wireless facilities. And we're going to introduce a new procedure called waiver and exception. Some people call it waiver or exception. I call it the waiver and exception express because it is essentially a one-way track, express track to move forward approvals through the OZA process. Let's talk about how that process works. Next slide. Uh, there's 12 steps. Um, I'm going to go through it really, really quickly, but they're all just mapped out here for you. This is all supposed to happen, by the way, in 90 days. This is all supposed to hit the uh, special process of being able to get through shot clocks, which may uh, or may not be enforceable uh, on specific cases, but they're there. They're in the, the, in the federal law says they're there. The applicant picks out a pole, any pole that's, that's closer than 30 feet to a house and they get a tfcg recommendation they then ask for a waiver all right they get to get that waiver and in order to qualify for these special procedures they have to get the poll owner's approval they have to pay an application fee they have to submit an oza application and there's certain data elements none of them are really extraordinary that go with that oza application it's different from the tower committee application but it's what's required for the oza review they have to pick out, this is a critical thing, number six there, they have to pick out at least one alternative pole that maximizes the setback or reduces the height. It doesn't have to be both. In other words, a pole that might be a little bit farther back or might be a little bit shorter, but they only have to provide one. They can provide more if they want, but why would they want to provide more? They have to provide one. Then what they do is they go to the planning director's office, to the county planning, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what's that, Montgomery County Planning. They get their approval that the application is complete. The OSA examiner schedules a public hearing and they notify, and this is who they notify. They notify any relevant municipality. So if you are in Tacoma Park, they're gonna notify the town of Tacoma Park. They're gonna notify the property owners, the HOAs, the civic condo or renter associations within 300 feet. That's about four or five houses. And again, it's a 300 foot radius, 300 feet. That's as far out as they're gonna notify it. They're gonna to have to put up a sign and they're gonna to have to post a notice on the OZA website 
as if everybody goes to the OZA website all the time. And at the end of that process, they get to attend a hearing. By the way, if, if you want to object, which is where the objection part of this comes into, the request for a waiver, you have to find out about it after you've been done over, you have to 30 days of receiving a notice. And assuming you're in that 300 foot boundary line, because those are the only people that are gonna have any standing, you've gotta be able to file your, um, your uh, objection. Next slide. Here's what happens at the hearing. This is what the OZIC examiner can do. This is all the OZIC examiner can do on a critical set of elements. If the examiner determines that additional height and reduced setback are needed to provide service, or if reduced setback or increased height will allow the support structure to be located on the property in a less visually obtrusive lo location, I don't know how something closer to your house could be less visibly obtrusive, but uh, theoretically that possibility exists, I guess. In that case, the hearing examiner may reduce the setback or they can increase the pole height up to 50 feet. So the only absolutely specified remedy that a hearing examiner has in terms of the setbacks and the height is to make the pole either closer or taller. I don't make this stuff up. This is U standard D part part five there, part six, I'm sorry. Next slide. But remember, the hearing examiner has the option of choosing either the poll that's been requested or a second alternative, but only the applicant, if I'm reading the ordinance correctly as it has been put forward, only the applicant gets to submit an alternative. The person that's objecting, that would be you, does not get to submit anything. You just get to object. The applicant gets to decide where there might be a suitable alternative. And you can imagine that if they put up an alternative, it's gonna be worse than what they're asking for. But that's the way this particular use standard uh, operates. That would be D part eight. Next slide. It's not all terrible, I guess. Screening is optional. Uh, the hearing examiner, if they can figure out how to construct screening, has the right, optionally, to use uh, screening colors or other visual mitigation options. Those are not specified. I'm not sure that a hearing examiner would know what they are. But based on the character of the residential properties within 400 feet, not 300 feet, 400 feet, I'm not quite sure why that would be the case, and the existing tree coverage and the vegetation and the design and presence of street lights, utilities, or parking lot poles, they can decide to do certain visual screening optional things. That's really the extent of what a hearing examiner can do. So I've just read that through to you. Let me go through a couple more quick uh, aspects of it. We're almost done with describing 1907. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the waiver and objection process allows for consolidation of hearings for applications within a thousand feet. What this is, is yet another part of the express train uh, uh, procedure here is that uh, if, if uh, Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T files a bunch of applications in the same general area, it is possible for the hearing examiner to aggregate those applications for up to a thousand feet and have everybody heard at the same time. Uh, what's onerous about that is the hearing examiner can decide, well, I really only want one or two of you to speak. I don't want all of you to speak on behalf of the group, right? Again, the effort here is to try to streamline this in a one-way direction, express train to move these things through. If you don't like that, and I, I would imagine that if you went through this process, you probably would not like that, your remedy, your only real remedy is to try to bring a lawsuit in district court. So you have to pay for your own lawyers and it might take several years. And uh, the, I wouldn't call that a remedy that appeals to most people given the fact that the cost to the applicant to have been able to push this thing through with a, a clearly highly favorable set of rules would be minimal compared to what you have to spend in district court. Okay, next slide. I promise you that I would talk about wireless administrative fails in Montgomery County, and I'm going to bring this all back into the discussion of why these administrative fails are so 
material to ZTA 1907. Um, but I also want to remind you, uh, as I did before, that we have been working, we're hoping that this is going to get uh, moving forward in earnest with the county executive's office. And again, he's focused on COVID to try to bring some true uh, administrative remedies to the dysfunction in the Tower Committee and DPS. But I'd just like to kind of recap for you some of the really bad stuff that has happened in the last 10 or so years. Uh, the poster child remains 7800 Brickyard Road in Potomac. Um, that poll, and I'm going to show it to you on the next slide, um, uh, particularly here, was supposed to have been put in. Oh, by the way, it's 42 feet for the nearest dwelling, which is a house that's right there. And the occupant of that dwelling actually testified uh, at not one, but two different hearings uh, before Chairman Reamer and uh, the Montgomery County Council. Let's go back uh, to the next slide, please. The red arrow on the left is where uh, the pole wound up, uh, the 68-foot pole at 7801 Brickyard Road. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 7800 Brickyard Road. The pole on the right is where it was supposed to go. As you can see, that is the utility lines. All those lines running across there are the distribution lines. And the original application was to make it about as tall as that, that pole in the, in the center uh, downrange there of the middle of your screen on the right side of the street, right there, there you go. That pole uh, was uh, essentially, uh, they were gonna be allowed to make something about that size and put uh, the wireless facility on top of it. They were told um, later on, um, the occupant of that house uh, was told that the reason that they could not do it was because it was structurally impossible uh, and simply not feasible to try to put a pole of that size inside of the utility lines uh, for, for, for National Electric Safety Code rules, right? They just couldn't do it. And they even, they even put that in a letter. So let me take you to the next slide. This is a half mile down the street, same utility lines. It's the same height as the pole at 7800 Brickyard Road. It's inside the distribution lines. It has almost the same antenna configuration. So what we were told was impossible, in fact, was very possible. And it was done two years after the fact uh, of what the poll ended up 7,800. By the way, the poll still sits there. No one will take any accountability for it. No one in the county has made any effort to initiate any kind of remediation or corrective action about that poll. Let's go to the next slide. Here are examples. This is why I wanted to make this very material to uh, what is being proposed in ZTA 1907. Here are examples of existing polls scattered around Montgomery County that have all been allowed inside of 60 feet in residential zones. What this list basically says is that Montgomery County has never bothered to enforce a critical element of the existing code. And that is that if there was an existing structure, by the way, almost all of these are replacements, even though they're labeled as co-locations, uh, I'm showing you what it says in the database. The, uh, the Tower Committee database. Every single one of these polls on this list, including the one that's uh, at, recorded as 7800 Brickyard Road, it's actually at 7800 Brickyard Road. Every single one of them is inside of 60 feet. Every single one of them should have had a conditional use hearing, right? Every single one of them. Uh, by the way, the top two there are in Piney Branch. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of those in just a second. But I want to make sure you understand that this is not a suburban issue exclusively. This is not an issue for, for up-county residential areas. This is an issue in all types of different residential neighborhoods that's been going on for a number of years. And that Department of Public Service, uh, Permitting Services and the Tower Committee have never taken any action to enforce this element of the, um, of the code. Next slide. This is uh, what I'm talking about, that this issue of, of uh, the cell poles being uh, put up right up against residences is not unique just to the suburban areas. This is 8707 Gilbert Place over, over Langley Park, right up, right near the uh, Prince George's County line on the east, east side of the county. Um, these are, this is a huge pole, 57 feet total height. 
Uh, there are double, um, uh, I'm sorry, there are, yeah, there's a uh, stack of four foot antennas on the top. Uh, it's just 27 feet from an adjacent four-story apartment building, which means that those antennas are very close to those upper windows, right? Um, next slide. This is a pole uh, that is 51 feet from a dwelling. It's in North Potomac. Uh, that pole, again, was put up without any kind of a conditional use hearing. It is, a, um, it is a, 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 a light pole. This is a good example of what a light pole is as to the other pole that I just showed you a minute ago, what the cobra head lights look like uh, on, on a pole like this. The building that's on the right where um, Theodora has the cursor, that white house over there is a daycare center. Can you see all the little uh, Tyco toys there in the driveway? Right there, yeah. That's a daycare center. Uh, this building uh, was mischaracterized in the application as being a commercial structure. It's a residence where the person happens to be a tradesman that drives uh, uh, panel trucks. Um, next, next slide. There's also lots of examples, and this is just a short list. This is by no means a comprehensive list. Lots and lots of examples of wireless facilities that have been installed on utility poles around Montgomery County, County that were much taller than what was actually recommended by the Tower Committee. In other words, what was actually permitted or maybe not permitted, maybe whatever PEPCO actually just figured out they would install was substantially taller than what had been recommended on the paperwork that uh, the Tower Committee went through. So on that first example, which is 8617 Piney Branch, what had been recommended was a 38 uh, foot, uh, 38 foot nine inch facility with antennas. There had been a 28 foot facility there is existing. They recommended something that would be 38 feet nine. What actually got installed was 47 feet nine inches tall or a 19 foot two inch increase. I won't go through all of these because I'm going to show you a picture one more of them, but I want to emphasize to you how dramatic those increases are. The Brickyard Road pole was originally, though down at the bottom there, was 25 foot, what they call a guy pole. It wasn't carrying utility poles. It was simply holding up the lines across the street. It's a structural tool that's used in, in, in uh, uh, electrical distribution. 42 foot increase. So in other words, about the same distance that that pole is from the house is the amount of additional pole that they stuck in the front yard. They took a 25 foot pole that had been hidden by small trees and they made it 42 feet taller. And again, DPS had no problem with allowing that to happen. Next slide, please. This is Arliss Street, the Flower Branch Apartments in, uh, again, back in Piney Branch. I've shown you two pictures there. I tried to get the stales uh, about even, but uh, you're gonna have to kind of use a little bit of imagination here, October, 2017, February, 2018. You can kind of gauge the increase based on the static street lamp, uh, decorative street lamp that's in there. They took that pole and they doubled its height with the antennas. And it's um, uh, 45 feet from the nearest apartments, which are those uh, balconies and those windows that you're looking at. Again, inside of 60 feet in a residential zone. What I want to also emphasize about this picture is Montgomery County has a set of construction specifications that says that if a, if a telephone pole is replaced and it's in a sidewalk, that for um, uh, uh, ADA access requirements, you're supposed to move that pole away from the sidewalk uh, and back on the margin, which would have been the grass, which unfortunately would have put it even closer to the apartment. So I'm not necessarily in favor of that. But as you can see, the Permit Department of Permitting Services also ignored that function and allowed them to dig up what had been an existing pole stuck in the concrete and put it right back into the sidewalk where it had been. Next, uh, next slide, please. Reality check, and I'm I'm wrapping this baby up, and then I'm going to take questions and uh, make sure that we cover this. Here's a reality check in Montgomery County. This has existed for years. It took us a long time before we fully connected the dots on this, and I wish I had understood it fully a lot sooner. Uh, there'd also been an awful lot of uh, circular explanations and finger pointing, but in Montgomery County, it is the wireless carrier AT and T, T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, Crown Castle that submits the application to the tower committee. But when it comes to the actual poll permit, 
and this is by far and away the largest number of them because interestingly enough not a lot of wireless facilities have gone on poles that would be owned on private property or that would be owned by Montgomery County if the utility company is the one that actually submits the permit for the modification the pole modification to allow the attachment of the wireless facilities so you have two completely different application processes you have the wireless carrier going to the tower committee they issue a recommendation but it's the utility company that goes to dps to get their permit dps is under no requirement to follow the tower committee recommendation it is just a recommendation that's what it's called that's the technical element in the code as it exists now and dps accordingly has historically ignored the requirement to track tower committee application numbers they don't even make a pretense of paying any attention to what the tower committee recommendation is or how it's being tracked it's not in their dps database even though we were made promises a few years ago that that would change and ultimately in, in reverse the tower committee does not track permits even though a copy of the relevant permits are supposed to be sent back to the tower committee tower committee has no idea what has been permitted and they have no idea what ultimately gets built and they will insist that it's not their responsibility anyway. Bottom line is it's very rare to find anything that is cross-referenced in either the DPS or the Tower Committee databases. Why is that important? Because it makes it very, very, very difficult for residents, mere mortals like you and me, to go and track down data about what has actually been uh, recommended, what has been permitted, and what has been actually built. Next slide, please. This I'm going to call my closer, and I'm sorry to close with something that is this dense and so difficult, but I'd like you all to sort of slowly read this with me, please, because this kind of brings into clarification the years of problems that we have, why it is that that ridiculous list of not only two tall poles, but poles inside of the minimum setbacks in residential zones have been allowed to occur forever and ever. This is a response, a written response, from the city of Tacoma Park, interestingly enough, regarding a resident inquiry about a replacement of a utility pole. This response was actually attributed to an attorney, a senior legislative attorney in Montgomery County who has since retired on January 7, 2020. It is an amazing discussion about how the Department of Permitting Services, how the county views the ordinance that has been on the books since 1996. What they are basically saying is that we do not have a permit process that would require a utility company to notify Montgomery County if it removes or replaces a utility pole, what's unsaid here, for purposes of a wireless facility. The county only considers new poles or replacement poles to require permits in those cases where a pole is not utility owned. Even though the ordinance, another section of the ordinance makes very specific reference to utility poles, what this senior attorney, a position to control and influence decisions on, on zoning decisions, basically came back to say is, it doesn't matter. We are not enforcing anything on um, the utility company. We don't have jurisdiction to do that. And, that. and that further went on to say, that's why the tower committee did not take into account the change of a pole, the pole had been replaced in preparation for uh, attachment of, of wireless antennas. The, the replacement had been paid for by Crown Castle. It's very clear in the work order that Pepco had. This was not being done for Pepco's purposes. It was being done for Crown Castle. And the uh, the incredible, amazing part of this whole thing is is that um, they basically weren't going to consider any changes in heights. They weren't going to regulate this explanation in January 2020 brings into crystal clear focus why it is that anything that's even being written in the code for changes now by uh, the Fed and being considered for presentation to the council, we really have to ask ourselves, well, wait a minute. You have one end of the entire county, the Department of Permitting Services, saying we don't care about no stinking ordinance that has to do with regulation of wireless facilities. We don't regulate utility poles. Just as we're getting ready to roll hundreds and hundreds of these wireless facilities into our residential neighborhoods. So that's my closer. That's a very, it's a very disappointing and frustrating way to close. 
uh, but all the more reason why we're fighting against 1907. So I'd be delighted to take your questions and comments. Um, you have got the ability to take those questions from the audience, I think. And I'm going to um, adjust the battery. I've got to connect in here to make sure my battery charges. So you're not going to see my face for a minute. Go ahead and ask the question. Okay, I'm, I'll uh, thank you so much. This was incredibly informative. We have a lot of questions and I know that there's a lot more to say. I, I hope that, I hope people around the county are watching this because this is so important and affects everyone in, in residential communities. And we haven't even talked about the impacts to the mixed commercial and, and, and residential uh, where people live, where the county has made an egregious decision in terms of the, the, uh, the rules that we have there. So going to some of the questions, um, just for clarification, because you just started talking about the polls, if there is a, a poll owned by Pepco, how is how does the coordination happen between the company and Pepco? And I thought you might also mention the issue of numerous polls in one place, as we have in Montgomery County, where you'll have because we have cable, we have all these other things that are on polls too. Could you talk about the process? Uh, all right. So you're t you there's there's different processes here. Um, the, there is a there is a separate group that is responsible for um, uh, certain types of, of infrastructure like cable television and so on and so forth. That most of that is buried, although some of that is definitely uh, cable wires that are being carried on Pepco utility poles. Uh, those those are uh, uh, regulated under a very different uh, framework, and those uh, cable TV providers actually pay. The county for the access. The uh, the greatest freebie that uh, that isn't being changed right now and that exists all the way along is, is that um, wireless providers are allowed to attach on utility poles in the public rights of way uh, that are owned by Montgomery County and they do not pay an access fee to the county for that privilege. Uh, so it's a total free ride that's being given to them. Whereas by contrast, we are also uh, charging the utility companies for access to the public, I'm sorry, the uh, cable television providers for access, we are not charging the wireless guys. Is that, was, is that your question? I think it hits a lot of pieces. I know this, it's a big- Okay, one. okay. Um, right. So given the change is, um, pop, here's a question, is unpopular with residents, what is the motivating factor for our council members to approve this? <laughs> well, I, I can't I can't speak to motives, but I, I have to say that part of it has been disinformation or misinformation or misunderstanding about the extent of 5G rollout in Montgomery County. And I think there is some sort of perception that if we don't allow this technology immediately to be installed uh, onto uh, poles inside of residential neighborhoods, that somehow those residential neighborhoods are missing out or being denied the ability to obtain 5G service. But as I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, the carriers themselves are claiming that that 5G coverage exists. And numerically, based on the applications of the swap outs that have been going on, we know the antennas are there that are delivering the service. And we know that people are picking up the signals. So it's a, it's a little bit disingenuous to say uh, that we have to put these things 30 feet from your house right now in order to allow you to get 5G, when we know that is absolutely factually not the, the case. And we also know that there's no reason to jam them inside of residential streets when we could probably put them out on what I would call the main roads, uh, the arterial roads that are out there that access some of our sub neighborhoods off to the, each side, uh, put the poles off into those streets as a first priority or prioritize those kinds of, of, of areas rather than, than insisting that it has to be up against your front windows because uh, it's, the, the, I haven't seen anybody prove to us yet. We've had a lot of assertions that this is necessary or that the technology is so limited. But as you saw from Mr. McAdam, as you saw from Jason, the, the engineer, that's factually not correct. And, and uh, unfortunately, certain members uh, of the council particularly have been pushing a narrative uh, that this is required, but they never support that narrative with facts or data. Right. I, I've heard a lot of summary statements that when you dig into it, they don't, they're not backed by the facts. They're not backed by facts. Um, no facts. And I gave you the statistics. I can show you, or I could take you to the rooftops and show you the antennas themselves. I know they're up there. I know they're on our big macro poles that are up uh, 
the lattice towers, the monopoles. They're in our county and they're working and people that want 5G have access to 5G. Yeah. So like, for example, voice is not going to necessarily be improved um, by the, the 5G networks. It's, this is about... No, in fact, 5G doesn't necessarily help your voice at all. 5G mm -hmm. is all about video. It's all about streaming media. It's all about speeding up data speeds so that if you want to play a very sophisticated multiplayer online game, or if you want to do brain surgery while moving in a driverless car, that, that would be, be great. The technology doesn't exist, and I probably wouldn't want my brain surgeon doing that surgery while he was in a driverless car, but, uh, but that's what they claim it's going to be able to do, but that won't help with your core services of voice or even rudimentary video services or so on. Uh, that's all being done pretty much by basic technology that, that is not impacted by 5G. Right, and just for clarification before I go to the next uh, question, it also, in our homes, most people, um, not everyone, which is a, a separate and, and an important issue, um, but people in, in residential neighborhoods have their own modem with their own uh, service. This is not about that because the service that you get through, like if you're in your house, with whatever you have, that is not about what's right outside. We're talking about being outside, you know, standing outside doing a game is what I'm trying to say. If you're inside your house, you're generally using the service in your home. Uh, absolutely correct. And let me, let me stress to you that in the United States today, with, with some very rare exceptions, um, very small places within a, a, a handful of metropolitan areas, New York City, San Francisco, special test beds, the fastest way that you can get an internet connection in the United States is with a uh, fiber optic cable and directly plugged into your computer, not through a Wi-Fi modem, but directly plugged into your computer. Um, the 5G C, uh, speeds that are being promised, uh, these supposed gigabyte, gigabit speeds and so forth, um, are, are aspirational. They're not being delivered. And they may be there, they're not here now. So uh, what you get through a cable connection, uh, be it Fios or through Comcast or whoever your provider is in Montgomery County, RCM, that's the fastest way you're gonna get a signal. Um, it, it is not possible yet, it may be in a few years, for you to get uh, comparable speeds through a, a wireless connection that you can get through a wired connection in your house. It simply does not exist. So um, where is a site where we can check 5G antennas by address? Because there are sites that do the macro towers, but it, how do we find out about the, the small cells as well and where there is 5G specifically? Um, well, you, you have the ability on the carrier's maps to zoom in on your zip code. And you can, infer, you can infer some things from those maps. If you go to a Verizon web page and it shows you that they've got their uh, 5G nationwide, then you could pretty, pretty rest assured that they have got, in Montgomery County, um, they've got 5G antennas up on uh, macro sites somewhere within uh, 3,000 feet or so of your house, maybe a little farther away. Um, the, you can use the, the tower committee's database as flawed as it is, we are lucky, we are fortunate. I wanna thank the, the, the tower committee for this one thing. We do have a database. Most municipalities don't have a database that is accessible. If you know how to use that database, you can actually then open up a copy of the wireless uh, application for a facility near you where you live. And you can look on the more current applications uh, if, the, if, if, if the information is provided. Uh, on that particular macro site, and you can find the antennas that are being used for 5G. They're typically identified as new radio or the acronym of NR. But the tower committee does not maintain an inventory on antennas, even though they're supposed to. They maintain an inventory on applications and sites. So you have to go to the voluminous um, documentation that is submitted. Uh, I, I say that they're supposed to submit the documentation. There is a uh, supplemental document uh, that, that for some sites that has been submitted uh, that would show you an inventory of the uh, antennas and the actual frequencies they're broadcasting at and whether or not they're being used for 5G. Uh, I did not include that layer of detail tonight. I come back again sometime and show you how that works. 
but it is possible through that database to find macrocytes near your house and look in the more current applications and check to see if they've got a 5G antenna. Great. Can you give me a link to to what to those databases as well? So after we'll send out an email and make sure that people have that. I put a link. Sure. Yeah. You know, let's do that. I should I should have had that in my slides. Yeah. I'm sorry. I work with it almost every day. But it, basically, Montgomery County, um, uh, Maryland, uh, gov has a towers uh, web uh, website, and one of the click throughs on that is uh, a link to the current database of applications and, and sites. I'm also going to put a link to the map of Montgomery County street lights, which can become cell tower sites where you can actually search how far away the street lights are from the dwelling. I'm going to put that in the chat. So my next question is. Uh, yeah, before you go off that, let me tell you something about that map. Okay. Uh, that was the map that was used, we think, in the official testimony that was brought forward in uh, support of the ZTA and was heavily referenced uh, by specific members of the council in the Fed committee meetings, uh, the work sessions or other. That map is incomplete. Mm. It only lists light poles. That is, in other words, utility poles that have got lights on them or poles that are owned by Montgomery County that have lights on them. Or in my neighborhood where I have these little spindly uh, lights that are 15 feet tall that are used exclusively as lampposts. There's a whole nother class of poles that don't have lights on them, utility poles that are just carrying utility lines or uh, stub poles that are holding those lines up that apparently were left off that map. So there are thousands, thousands of poles that were not counted. And one of the justifications was, well, we need them, we need to have them every 30 feet because there aren't enough poles. There were thousands of uncounted poles in that map that was put forward at the Fed work sessions. Oh. Sorry so, about that. So I, I interrupt your question. That Yeah, this is, we're just, we're going all the way here. So do municipalities such as the town of Chevy Chase or the village of Martin's Additions have standing to sue if a cell pole or antenna injures a resident within the boundaries of these municipalities? Uh, there's, uh, well, first of all, let's make sure you understand uh, cell poles have no boundaries. They don't care anything about um, jurisdictional lines. Uh, Montgomery County's um, cell phone, uh, I'm sorry, cellular 5G configurations, um, uh, wireless configurations, what I meant to say, uh, have got plenty of overflow from the District of Columbia, uh, from Prince George's County, uh, in and out of the various jurisdictions that are there. Martin's Editions, Chevy Chase, uh, are primarily being serviced by uh, tall buildings in, uh, in and along Wisconsin and Connecticut, and in fact, all the way over to uh, 16th Street um, in Silver Spring. So, uh, and then also from uh, antennas that are in um, Washington, DC. So there's, uh, uh, there's all kinds of uh, coverage um, that's coming out from other, uh, other jurisdictions and flowing back and forth in terms of wireless signals. So I have two questions about preemption. Does 1907 preempt local municipal efforts to regulate the placement of wireless facilities? That's one question. And then the second is, what is the status of federal preemption of state, county, or local regulation of wireless? Is that still in effect or has it been reversed by any of the litigation around the small cell order? Let's start with the first one, which is pretty important. Yeah, so yes, to answer your question, uh, if you live in a municipality where your zoning uh, is dependent on Montgomery County, uh, which means that you're, you're using the Department of Permitting Services for certain classifications of it. Uh, and I think that's most of the smaller municipalities. Gaithersburg, no. Rockville, no. Most of the smaller municipalities are using uh, the services of the Department of Permitting Services. Then yes, this ordinance would effectively take precedence over what your, what your local ordinance has. Now, again, you, I'm not a lawyer on this. You'd have to talk to your municipal attorneys on that, but I believe that this would supersede what your municipality is, uh, has got on the books. Oops, I tipped over there, sorry. About that. What about the status of the federal preemption of state, county, or local regulation? Um, um, yeah, and thank you for reminding me of that. That is an evolving thing. Uh, I mentioned to you before that there is a, um, uh, still a long way to testing all of those rules. But uh, unfortunately, the litigation 
that was uh, decided in the Ninth Circuit, um, including um, the city of Portland case and uh, uh, did not go well for municipalities and the uh, second and third orders that the FCC has put out that have uh, that keep narrowing and narrowing and narrowing the amount of control that municipalities have uh, is, is unfortunately marching along. We do have a different um, control now over the FCC. It's democratically controlled. I don't think they're going to be as quite as aggressive as the uh, uh, FCC under Chairman Pai. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of uh, lightning uh, or reduction of, um, of some of their initiatives or efforts out there. But uh, the one thing that we did win on in the Ninth Circuit was aesthetics. Uh, the Ninth Circuit did remand back to the FCC rules that they had tried to preempt aesthetics. And unfortunately, Montgomery County has not done anything to protect its rights on aesthetics. And most certainly 1907 doesn't do anything to help uh, um, uh, opposing requirements on uh, wireless facilities for aesthetics or concern about aesthetics. Thank you. Um, so there's another question related to, well, um, pole height. Uh, a lot of this discussion is about pole height. This may be worse aesthetically, but if the pole is very high, it may be further away from people or wildlife at ground level, and therefore the radiation exposure would be less intense than a pole that's only 10 or 20 feet. That's, that's true. Um, and, and in most cases, those super tall poles do not exist, at least in my experience, inside of residential neighborhoods. What we are concerned about is that it is possible that those poles do exist taller than 50 feet in residential neighborhoods. And there is no prohibition about using those poles as a small cell or wireless facility, even though the FCC has kind of a gratuitous hand back to communities to find small cells as being on poles under 50 feet. Uh, unfortunately, the, the folks in the Fed committee decided to go ahead and waive that and, and say you could put it up on a higher pole. I do agree, a taller pole farther away from people is generally gonna produce based on the size of the antennas and the, and the output of those uh, antennas is generally gonna produce less radio frequency um, hazard to a pole that's right up against your windows. But what we're objecting to is the use, um, the use of those poles if we don't have to. I'd like to see us try to keep them farther away from houses, but also try to put them on smaller poles, particularly around residential areas. And if I may add, the addition of a pole, be it higher or shorter, is going to overall increase the level of radio frequency in the community compared to if there was not one, this is important. It will not be as much if it's higher, but it still will be um, substantially increasing the amount when you have the deployment of a small cell network in a community. And the other thing is that birds will perch on poles, no matter you know how, if they're 10 or higher than the 10, if they go up 10 or if they go up another 10 foot. So, and, and of course our insects are flying around as well right near the poles and the limits that we have are not set to protect birds, bees, or trees. So I just wanted to throw, add that. Um, and, and you know, I, when I first got into this, and I've mentioned this before uh, in our conversation, Theodora, my focus was not radio frequency. My, my focus was on aesthetics, was on property values. It was on just keeping our neighborhoods from being cluttered with junks on poles, yeah. uh, more infrastructure that we don't want. And I lived in a neighborhood where everything's underground. But I'll tell you what, as I've gotten into this deeper, I've become more and more concerned about the abuses, particularly on rooftops, particularly on facilities near schools, near hospitals, where very high powered, high intensity antennas are being installed, uh, where there's high concentrations, multiple antennas. I would like to come back. I'd like to talk to you about rooftops. Uh, I did not do that tonight for the interest of time, but uh, we've done an awful lot of research and we've been fighting in the last year, particularly some really onerous um, swap outs on rooftops. We have rooftops in this county that are 8,900%. That's 80 time, 89 times over the permissible limits uh, allowed by the FCC. Now that's not desirable limits. That's not European limits. That's not limits that we'd like to see the FCC change down. Those are the very generous limits that exist today. 
89 times over those limits. And those antennas were recommended easily by the tower committee and they're operational today. And there's multiple rooftops. Um, and I would like to come back and explain that because because you're right, the big antennas are gonna generate more RF radiation that otherwise wouldn't exist. In a neighborhood, if you put up a pole uh, and it's a tall pole, it's probably gonna be able to handle those higher capacity antennas, four foot, six foot panel antennas right. that are gonna put out an awful lot of effective radiated power. And that's what we're really concerned about. So we are definitely gonna do a, a rooftop session for sure. I wanna go back to something we talked about. There are a few questions and I'm gonna put them together. So um, one person asked, what value to homeowners is, five, is a 5G antenna in their yard when 5G provides speeds slower than their already existing home Wi-Fi? But then let me add in this question because I think we have to, to explain uh, the how your home has a service which is different than what is outside, which is why many people, uh, I think this is an unnecessary network. So someone else asked, well, how do you respond to people who say 5G will improve cell phone communications while fiber will just in improve computer and download? So it's apples and oranges. So let, could you tease that out to explain that, the how, what the 5G network will do and how it's different from what is inside our homes? Well, so first and foremost, the 5G network is meant to enable people to be mobile, to take your device and to be able to have breathtakingly fast uploads and downloads of data so that you could do uh, instantaneous um, conversations with no flicker, no waiver uh, on a video chat like we're doing right now, or that you can upload and download movies, or you can play multiplayer, high intensity, high graphics games to make your, uh, your iPhone or your Samsung device, whatever it is, as, as gorgeous and as sharp and as clear with super hyper uh, uh, pixel density, hyper density you pick, uh, uh, pixels on your screens and so on, uh, uploading and downloading photographs. So, to, to make your mobile experience beautiful. But there's another reason that the uh, wireless carriers are so uh, uh, focused on that. They hope to displace that cable. They hope to take you away from being dependent on that, that, that I call a cable, but I really mean that fiber optic connection and, and uh, switch off and no longer pay for Fios or your Comcast connection and just get it through your Verizon or your AT&T or your T-Mobile phone. And there's a financial model behind that. And in fact, uh, Verizon has been very upfront about it. They really know that it's a lot cheaper to maintain a uh, hundred houses on a wire wireless connection than it is a hundred houses on a wired connection. So they're trying to convince you that they're going to give you speeds that are good enough or fast enough uh, and, and wean you off of your uh, cable connection. Uh, but, uh, but, but again, we're, wow. this is, this is a business. Oh, and they've been very upfront about it. I have interviews on that. We have to post those for you. The, the, uh, the, the challenge here that we have to understand is we're asking a municipality to empower a business model, to subsidize a business model by allowing free access, by allowing special treatment to come in and compete against another business model, which is a buried wired connection. And they're doing it on, on the backs of taxpayers who are subsidizing this. And this is what, as we, as we look at this more and more and more closely, for example, in Montgomery County, Montgomery County gets an access fee for a cable subscriber. And those access fees have been declining. Why? Because more and more cable subscribers are going over to their cell phone. They're not buying their content anymore off of their cell phone and off of their wired connection. And that means that income to Montgomery County has been shrinking, but there's been no replacement income coming from the wired wireless devices for that income that we're losing for the cable franchises. And I don't understand why the county government doesn't understand. They're in the budget cycle right now. And I know one person who's been trying to bring this issue forward in a big way, but it's like, it's not sinking in. We're, we're subsidizing one model to compete against a different model. And supposedly that subsidization is justified because it's gonna make your experience on your mobile device better so that that brain surgeon could do the surgery while in the driver's car uh, or while sitting on the beach. 
um, but that that is it's a competitive business model concept here, and we're being asked to help uh, accept legislation for that. Supposedly a benefit to us, but mostly a benefit to the wireless wire, wireless companies. Hi, thank you. So I um, well, I'm going to do clarification of another question that was asked. Um, I I think you answered. Oh, no, not about the st The question is, does the town of Chevy Chase have standing to sue on behalf of residents if a tower is placed in violation of their own permitting ordinance? Say that, read that one back to me again. So I'm sorry. It, does, does the town of Chevy Chase have standing to sue on behalf of residents if a tower is placed in violation of their own permitting ordinance? Or are you saying the local ordinance would have no effect if it passes? So I, uh, yeah, I again, I'm not a lawyer on that one, so I wouldn't be able to, to uh, uh, render a, uh, a, an, a, an opinion or that would make uh, any difference. But I would urge that individual to go to their to their town officials and talk to them and that town attorney and say, "Hey, I'm concerned about this. Uh, I think that Montgomery County has overstepped their boundaries." Uh, I think we should sue, uh, or I think we should fight this. Um, and 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 frankly, unfortunately, um, there have there haven't been a lot of those polls put up yet in those little jurisdictions, but they're coming. I can assure you that they're coming. And um, uh, I think you should be. Uh, I think you're going to be amazed at what Montgomery County believes it can do uh, and has rights to do in terms of authorizing polls or what Mount Kemi County won't do because it doesn't believe it regulates utilities. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So um, a question is asked, and I think it's good to reiterate again, uh, what can we do as individuals to influence our council members to vote no on this measure? And I well, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe we'll take us all the way back up to the front of the, of the presentation. Can we do that? We're getting close to the nine o'clock hour here. So I want to make sure we're Respect everybody's time. What am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, slide slide five. Okay, give me a second. Yeah. And I did yeah. put in the um, chat the link to the uh, Q and A. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm doing two things at once to the letter writing campaign. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. And that's let fabulous. Me a while I just get this back. Slide five. That's a really neat tool while you're bringing up the slide. It's a really neat tool. It's very easy to use. It generates a letter to the, um, to the county council. If you don't want to make a call, if you want to do something really fast, it is a fabulous, simple tool. And um, uh, it, it gets the message out there. Uh, we also, are got, I think, are going to be developing a petition. So we're going to have other ways for people to add their names. But uh, that's, that's something that's available right now. And you can certainly get it out there. So slide number five. You know, no I'm having a problem with the computer. It's not. Um, is it locking up? It's not. It's not doing it. I just have a lot. Uh, okay, going on. that's that's all right. I'm just going to read it back to you. I can see it on my screen. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm going to turn away from you for a second, but definitely yeah. call your council members. Um, definitely demand a new hearing. It's been more than. Uh, it's almost 18 months now. This is ridiculous to change a bill this substantially and not allow the council members to hear from their constituents again. And, and all they're gonna hear is displeasure. There is no popular movement supporting the sponsors of this bill. I wanna make sure you're clear on that. This is an industry bill that's been put forward by certain members of the council for the industry. It is not supported by residents. Uh, you could use our action network tool. You can enlist your friends and your family. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter. You could definitely have a sign and, and join our march when we figure out how we're gonna do it uh, sometime in very late May or early June. Talk to your mayors, your town councils, if that's applicable, or your HOA folks. Make sure they register their opposition. Opposition by these little local municipalities is important. And I know that um, uh, I think it was the town of Somerset. I think also the town of, uh, or the city, I guess, town or, town or city of Tacoma Park have weighed in previously in their opposition in 1907. And be sure to add your name to our mailing list. But let me tell you, County councilmen know something. In Montgomery County, 2,000 people who are opposed to something can swing an election. And those council members know that. 
they know that there's a lot of if there's a lot of people that are holding a grudge about a piece of legislation that passed or by votes, particularly of at-large members, 2,000 votes is going to swing an election. And so if, my goal is if we can get 2,500 people to reach back to the council and say, no, hell no, stop this. I think that's a significant number. And it's a very small number, relative to speaking. But in Montgomery County, when 2,500 people respond to something, that's a big deal to most council members. And so that's where our goal is. We want to get as many folks again to expressing their displeasure at ZTA 1907. So what about the existing fiber optic cable? Well, I mean, can you first talk about where we have fiber optic cable in the county? Is that owned by the wireless companies? And the other part of the question is, suppose a municipality provided fiber optic cable to all its residents, would that financially deter the wireless companies from installing 5G small cells? Uh, a couple of questions here. Let me take them in sequence. First of all, Montgomery County is a national leader in access to wired broadband. Um, I believe I can dredge this up, and I, and I think I'm correct on this. Not, uh, in, in terms of a percentage of our population, 97%, that's a huge percentage, 97% of Montgomery County residents live near an access point for fiber. Now, there was just a study that was done uh, within the last month about the 3%, most of them are in the agricultural reserve that do not have access to fiber optic. In other words, there are individual farms where no one has ever bothered to run a cable out because the, the actual houses were a half mile apart and it wasn't worth the money to string the fiber out there. But 97% of Montgomery County residents have access now that doesn't mean necessarily that you have a family budget that will afford it, but there are programs through the Montgomery County Public Schools, through various nonprofit organizations, through the county itself, where if you go and fill out a form and say, yeah, I can't afford it, they'll help pay for your access. And so nationally, Montgomery County is very, very proud of the fact that a very high percentage of people have access to and have financial support for their ability to get to um, uh, coverage for, uh, I'm sorry, access to a fiber thing. There's other programs, believe it or not, that for households that still can't do wired for whatever reason, they have also got subsidies for uh, cellular connections, uh, cell phone connections, but that's not a 5G connection. They're not gonna pay for a 5G connection, which is nothing more than a super enhanced service that you know, most people don't need. But, uh, but even in that, for those rare situations where the person says, I'm out of the house a lot, I need help with my cell phone bill, there's programs to help pay for that. Montgomery County is a national leader in that. Now, in terms of the, the conflict, and, the, and I think the company you're talking about specifically is Verizon. Verizon has got a legacy copper business, they have got a fiber business, and they have a wireless business. They are rapidly trying to get out of their copper and uh, there's been a lot of issues associated with the discontinuance of traditional copper telephone service. There's, a, there's still people in Montgomery County that have that. Um, I, I'm a Verizon subscriber to uh, wired services. And then they have a separate operating division uh, that does wireless. But as I mentioned to you before, Verizon has made it very clear that one of their strategies is to try to convince people, drive people, to a dependence on uh, wireless service uh, over wired service because they know their legacy network, maintaining it connections to homes is gonna become more expensive over time. It'll be cheaper to go ahead and like you depended on cell phones. Right, and as I understand it, it's not uh, regulated the same. So no. much less regulation. They go and that's on. another thing you wanna make sure that you're clear. At the state of Maryland, there is no such thing as a public utility commission regulation over wireless carriers. That, that, that they are not regulated. Legacy Verizon is regulated, but their, but their fiber, um, their fiber is somewhat regulated by Montgomery County because of the franchise agreements, but their wireless services have absolutely no regulation at all. There's no regulation on prices or demands for service levels or access or anything else. So let me, let me get this this question in about fall zones. Do taller poles or any poles for that matter require a greater fall zone from a dwelling to reduce the risk of damage if a pole collapses? 
right? Because we've got these poles now, they could be 30, they could be up to 50 feet, but there's a 30 foot setback. And they're just like a tree with enough wind, with the right wind condition, with the right soil conditions, uh, they can fall down. Uh, here's, a, here's a little factoid for you. How, do you. how much of a telephone pole gets buried? I'll tell you how much. If you have a 30 foot pole in front of your house, three feet of that pole plus 10%, or uh, I'm sorry, three feet, 10%, or uh, two plus two feet. So a total of five feet of that pole gets buried. So a 30 foot pole becomes a 25 foot pole that's in the ground, but that doesn't, but there's no concrete around it or any other kind of stuff. If there's enough loading on that pole, so antennas and the cabinets and everything else. And if the soil conditions are wet enough, it's very easy to blow those things down. Uh, we do get tornadoes, we do get high winds, we do get uh, occasional hurricanes. So putting a pole that close to your house is like putting a very large tree that close to your house. You do have that risk. It could fall over. And they do fall over and they do snap. It takes a lot of wind, but it does happen. And also, and I know Sue's put forward a lot of this uh, and MC4T has, 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 has this on their page, which I know you're updating the, uh, the web page. But the issue of the equipment boxes, which are heavy, the antennas mm. are heavy. And you can have as many of these 12 cubic feet and equipment boxes as you want with the current ZTA. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, there's no limit on the amount of equipment boxes. And that picture you put up at the beginning shows a bunch of equipment boxes. And I'm sure, and I once Sue had those pictures showing all those poles that were like leaning or- yeah. I don't have them tonight, but, uh, but there are a few of them that are out there. The, um, the, the frustrating thing about the equipment cabinets, and this has to do with FCC regulations, is you're correct. There is no limit on the number of equipment cabinets. There's a limit on the actual physical size. It's an absurd limit, which is 28 cubic feet, uh, which, is, which is huge. But um, there is no limit to the number of equipment cabinets. And, and actually, the tower committee did approve 18 applications a year ago for ground mounted cabinets. In other words, where the cabinet that was on the pole, they didn't want to, they didn't want to put any more weight on the pole structurally. It couldn't take it. So they said, well, you know what, we'll put that cabinet down on the ground. Mm -hmm. And the tower committee had no problem with that. Well, we had a great problem with that. We <laughs> said, wait a minute, you're now allowing the footprint of this facility to go down onto the ground. The, even the FCC, the FCC is very generous. Even the FCC considers that to be a substantial change. It's something that should be specially evaluated and considered. Montgomery County's code, however, calls every equipment cabinet a minor modification. That's in a separate part of the code that the zoning text amendment we're looking at tonight. But that minor modification, right, is, is simply a piece of paper passed through and it's signed off. And, and for reasons which we don't know, we think because they don't want to be a target, the wireless companies got approvals for those ground mounted cabinets, but none of them have been installed. They got the approvals, but none of them have been installed. And that was the same reason I showed you before, you know, where, where there had only been two applications and none year to date on utility poles. For whatever reason, all the wireless guys pulled back, preferring to wait for ZTA 1907, and they have not installed those ground cabinets, even though the tower committee gave them permission. Wow. Yeah. So, um. And pardon me if I missed it because we're going over so many things, but there is no fall zone. There's no fall zone that, okay. Um, there are two people who- Well, and that also applies for ice, by the way, or, or the equipment, yeah. Yeah, in other words, ice can oh, fall yeah, up. Ice right. can build up on it and it can fall up, yeah. 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 When we put that, I put the map in that shows all the poles and how close they are to the homes. And when you first pull it up, it looks like you can't get in. You have to have a password. You just say cancel and it, that disappears and you can actually look at the map. I don't know why that's there, but don't worry about that. Does not, you don't need a login or a password. You can just go forward. Uh, there, is, there is one question here in, in the chat that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, why will the county not charge an access fee to the wireless providers? Uh, I, can, I can sort of answer that for you. Franchise agreements, agreements were written years ago under the prior administration when the philosophy was that Montgomery County was hell bent for leather to get 5G and wireless, well, the, the, the wireless services that were available then, which was 3G, uh, they didn't want to do anything to impede the wireless carriers and they wanted to, to make it as easy and effective as that. So they waived all the fees. There were, some, there were some supposed legal reasons for that, 
but they waived all the fees. Um, I am told, it is rumored at least, that there is some sort of a new franchise agreement that's under negotiation for access to polls that Montgomery County owns and that there are access fees that are being considered. But we don't have any details on that and there's, not, there's no transparency on what those efforts might be. But uh, there's rumors that there might be a new franchise agreement out there. But certainly under the current franchise agreements uh, that it would allow access to. Okay, so while he's coming back on, and you know, if only we had 5G, um, although I, if you watch BBC when they did the first 5G transmission, you'll see that it didn't work. And that's always a fun video clip to put up. Well, our correspondent Sarah Walton is at Covent Garden in central London, where folks have now been accessing 5G. Uh, no snafus, no problems so far. Well, hopefully not, and I do hope you're hearing us loud and clear because we are broadcasting over the 5G. The BBC has today become the first British broadcaster to go live using a commercial uh, 5G internet connection. Uh, if we are breaking it, though, that may be because, as you heard in Rory's report, the coverage is still at the moment a little bit patchy. Just to demonstrate, uh, this is a 5G-enabled phone. It's connected to the EE network here in the centre of London, and we're actually only getting a speed of 40 megabits per second. Now that's the equivalent of what you would get off your home internet connection. But EE says in their testing they've been getting speeds of up to 800 megabits per second. Now if we all started getting that on our mobile phones, what it means is that the sort of things we do all day long on our phones, uh, streaming music, downloading TV programs and films and, uh, and uh, putting photos on social media, we could do that almost instantaneously. So still only available in a few places at the moment. OK, but it's gonna okay be Sarah, I'm going to have to interrupt you there because bizarrely the 5G line isn't working properly. So uh, apologies to our viewers for that. Somebody asked, um, where can I find the best references on uh, 5G in health or on these frequencies in health. I've spent over 40 years in the technology industry. My most recent position was president of Microsoft Canada. And I've seen the tremendous benefit technology can provide. I've also seen the potential harm if technology is not used correctly. In my opinion, our current implementation of wireless technology is not safe. And I'm especially concerned with our plans for 5G. I don't make this statement lightly. I've met with experts from institutions such as Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and the University of Toronto. And I've met with an expert advisor to the World Health Organization and one of the lead scientific writers for Al Gore's team that won the Nobel Prize. Over 250 scientists from 40 countries signed a formal appeal to the World Health Organization and the United Nations member states expressing their concern over the harmful effects of wireless technology and added an additional appeal for the effects of 5G, especially the effects on children. Hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers have been published demonstrating harm to humans and the environment. This evidence includes increase in cancer, sperm damage, reproductive harms, memory and learning deficits, especially in children, and damage to our DNA, nervous systems, and the cells in our bodies. Unfortunately, Health Canada and the FCC are stuck in the 1920 science that states tissue must be heated to be harmed. And I put in the chat uh, a link to uh, EH Trust, where we have a list of published science in the peer-reviewed published literature, uh, it has a list of citations and describes uh, different studies have, that have been done looking at impacts to humans, impacts to animals, to insects, to trees. And you also can watch the talk that I gave uh, previous to Rick's, and it's all online. I'll put a link in the chat as well, where I review some of the science and also share, showcase different scientists talking about it. But if you want to find out about the health effects and the research that has been done, please go to Environmental Health Trust at ehtrust.org, because there are hundreds of scientists who are recommending a halt to 5G and a reduction in the levels of exposure we have now, certainly not an increase 
in exposure, which is what, what is gonna be happening because of the published research that shows harmful effects at levels that are below FCC limits. And our lawsuit against the FCC is addressing the fact that the FCC has not updated their limits on wireless cell towers, cell phones, wireless everything since 1996. And actually the limits that we have in, that were set in 1996 were based on science from 10 years and even earlier than that. Um, huge appreciation, Theodora, to you for managing all the technical aspects of this webinar and for um, uh, managing the questions from our audience and to the participants tonight. Thank you for your time. Sincerely appreciated your interest in this topic and I hope you found the information helpful. Even more importantly, I hope it will cause you to redouble your efforts to reach out to every member of the council, tell them that you're opposed to ZTA 1907 and that we must stop this very bad zoning text amendment. Again, appreciate your time. Look forward to getting together again soon. Have a great evening.